Welcome to Recovered Truths. My name is Greg Racer, the pastor here at Crosswork Bible Church. Uh, we invite you to come join us. We currently meet at the Holiday Inn Express Conference Room. That's 1000 Vandalay Drive here in Frankfort, Kentucky. We're right next to Panera Bread. So uh, come join us. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and then we get on with the service at 10.30. Uh, if you've been following along with us, uh, hopefully you know that we're going through the book of Romans. Uh, we're up to Romans chapter 8. And we, we've, gone through, we've gone through taking a look at some information, right? Uh, we talk about in the first five chapters how God lays down this issue of our justification. The fact that we can have salvation given to us as a free gift by us simply placing our faith and trust in what Christ did on the cross. That we believe the verses on the page and that's the, that's the final issue. We don't have to walk an aisle, say a prayer, or give money to anybody or anything like that. All we have to do is simply trust what Christ did for us on the cross. That He died for our sins, was buried, and then rose again the third day uh, for our justification. Then, we started taking a look at the next foundational stone, if you will, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. Uh, we've gone through chapter 6, which tells us we're dead to sin. Sin no longer controls you. Uh, we actually have, have some power in that situation. We choose to sin or not. Romans chapter 7 tells us that we're dead to the law. We're no longer held under the law. And then we find out in Romans chapter 8 that we are dead to the flesh. In fact, one of the things we found out is there's a difference between carnal, being carnally minded and spiritually minded. Carnally minded says we're going to follow the flesh. And what we find out is that, that those who walk in the flesh cannot please God. And so then God has taken that out of the way to where we don't have to uh, be under submission or control of the flesh, but we can actually uh, have, have power through the Spirit. And we find out who that Spirit is in Romans chapter 8. Now, if you've been with us, hopefully you know we've gone down through the first 25 verses of the book of Romans where we've been talking about the, 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 the way that you can split up Romans chapter 8. Right? We've looked at verses 1 through 5 where it talks about our position that we're dead to the flesh. Romans chapter 8 verses 6, 7, and 8 gives us a provision. There, here is how God has made it possible for you to now walk and live without the flesh. And then Romans 9 through, or Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 13 says, here's the product that we see based upon the provision that we're given on our new position. And then in Romans chapter 8 verse 14, we find out that we have another position that no longer are we, not only are we dead to the flesh, but we are alive unto God and we actually are sons of God. And that's a new position that we have. And so that's, that's an important thing for us to be able to know and understand. Verses 15, 16, and 17 says, here's the provision that God has given us a position of being sons of God. But not just that, but we have the Spirit, where the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God and that we are children of God. And since we're children of God, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And then verses 18 through the rest of the chapter shows us here's the product. And Paul starts off with problems. <laughs> you notice in verse 18 he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That's an amazing thing because we shouldn't get stuck on the sufferings. But Paul tells us, here's how you deal with the sufferings. Here's what it's going to look like when you do that. And we go down through the first, the first few verses there. We got down to verse 25 and we find out that there's a hope. Notice in verse 24. We have, this, we have this adoption that we're waiting on in verse 23, the redemption of our body. Verse 24 says, For we are saved by hope. Now, we've talked about that word saved before. That's not... That's not initial salvation. There, there's different tenses and different ways that God uses the word saved or salvation. Salvation in Scripture, or being saved, isn't always from the death penalty of sin. Okay? And this instance here, what is it that we're saved by is hope. Now, anytime you come to that word saved or salvation, you've got to ask yourself, saved or having salvation from hope? what? 
Well, in the context here, he's talking about what? Problems in life. It's what he starts off with in verse 18. The sufferings of this present world, of this present time. And that's the issue that we find today. And everybody goes through problems all the time. No one is exempt from it. It rains on the just and the unjust. And what we find out is, as we go down through these passages, we find out not only they do they groan and travail in, in pain, but we ourselves also groan and travail in pain. We're not exempt as Christians. We're not exempt from life happening. We're not exempt from the, the consequences of the decisions that we make. We're not exempt from accountability of those actions and things that we do say or whatever. Um, the, the fact that the world says you're not responsible for yourself or any of your actions is strictly and totally and completely against God's Word. Right here he's talking about the fact that we go through things too just like the rest of the world. We're not exempt from it. And just because we're in Christ doesn't give us a, a pass on those things. But here in verse 24 it says, For we are saved by hope. And we've talked about what hope is. Hope is a confident expectation of a thing that we know is going to take place. He says, But, a hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Where do we find out about hope? We find out through the Scriptures. And faith in what the Scripture says is what gives us that hope. Notice in verse 25, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That's the issue. Patience. Enduring. Going through life's problems. Now, one of the things that's interesting is we find out that, that you know, there are no special sufferings. You know, people aren't going through things because God's trying to get their attention. Uh, we, we find out that, that, that those things are just common to man. But we have a different way to deal with it. And the way that we deal with it, we find out here. Let's pick up in verse 26 and we'll go down through here and we find out exactly what he's dealing with. Notice in Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Likewise... The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now we stop there for just a second. What's interesting to me is that word also. Now, notice if you flip back into chapter 8 verse 24, he says, for we are saved by hope. Verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Patience and hope go together. In fact, if you remember, Romans chapter 5 tells us what? Tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope, right? And th those are those things that we've got to think about. And that's an important thing to know. Tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope. It's important for us to remember those things. But notice here in 826, likewise... The Spirit, and that's capital S, also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Have you ever, have you ever found yourself going through just life problems and you just, I, have, I, don't, I, don't, even, I don't even know where to begin. How, how, can I, how can I pray about this particular situation? But here's what's interesting. Notice it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. What's going to happen is the, the Spirit helps us endure our sufferings with that hope. And what we see here is the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now notice what he says one of our infirmities are. For we know not what we should pray for, notice, as ye ought. Go real quick to Luke chapter 11. It's really interesting when you, when you start looking at some of these things because, you know, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple issues that most people have 
um, you know, you, 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 go, you go talk to people and you give them the gospel and things like that and you say, okay, you know, a lot of people, if they do it incorrectly, they say, you know, pray this prayer and God will save you. Well, the prayer never saves. The prayer can't save. In fact, we find out through Scripture that prayer is a work. So if you tell somebody you have to pray in order to get saved, then you've taught them you have to work to get saved. Now, is prayer an important aspect to that salvation? Yeah. But the prayer doesn't save. Make sure that they know that their faith is fully relying on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and that alone. After that... You can have them pray, but un make, make sure that they know and understand that the salvation is separate from the prayer. The prayer really has to do with thanks, thanksgiving to God that they are now saved. And it's not a God save me type thing, it's God thank you for saving me. Prayer is an important part to it. But notice here in Luke chapter 11, this is, this is one of those reasons why a lot of times we don't know how to pray as we ought. Notice this in verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Notice, as we take a look at this, he says, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, most people, when they, when they, that, that's one of the reasons why people write things out and say, "When you, you, you say this, you say this prayer, and, and, and you'll be fine." And I've seen people do this a lot of times before. Sometimes when they, when they're called to go pray before, before a group or something, they'll type it out because they don't know how to pray. And a lot of times, I know there's certain things that we probably want to say on, on certain situations and, and, and things like that, but. If, if our life is filled with prayer, biblical prayer, I'm not talking, I'm not talking like the, the praying as the heathen do, but I'm talking about actual prayer. When our life is so just saturated with prayer, and you say, well, how do we have time to do all that? Well, we'll talk about that as we go through this issue. But notice, what, what, are the, what does the disciple say? Teach us to pray. Notice, as John also taught his disciples. So John had some disciples that he taught how to pray, and they're saying, Lord, teach us to pray. Do you know what that means? That means prayer has to be taught. Now, what's, what's really interesting is he goes on down through here, and this is the same prayer that we find over in Matthew chapter 6. This is a slight, slight difference, but it's the same prayer. Notice what he says. Verse 2, And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. By the way, this isn't the Lord's Prayer. If you want to find out the Lord's Prayer, go find out when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the Lord's Prayer. The, the prayer he's showing here is he's teaching them how to pray. That's why it's important for us to know verse 1 there. He's teaching them, here's some information that you need to know how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All right. So, where is it that their Father is? Their Father's in heaven. Now, when we come to this, every time you pray today, do you have to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No, you don't have to do that. Because God's doing something different today. And the only way that you know that is you learn from Scripture and then you change your prayer life. You know, one of the things, one of the things we've talked about this before, is one of the things that goes away that's kind of tough to hang on to sometimes is our prayer life once we actually learn how to study the Bible. Because we find out that we've been praying for things that we already have. Or we pray for things that we aren't supposed to be praying for. And so then when that happens, you got to think, okay, well, I've been praying wrong my entire life. Well, let's, let's start off with this. First of all, prayer is just speaking to your Father. That's all it is. It's nothing, it's nothing, nothing special. 
as far as, you know, you don't have to do certain things. You don't have to go off into a prayer closet and, and pray through and hope you can pray through and break through heaven and get some sort of, you know, rain down on you, all that stuff. That's not what it is. Prayer is just communicating to your Father your desires and your needs based on a proper understanding of God's Word. That's why it's important, as, as he says there, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We should know. And so what we find out here is, what, is he, what does Jesus Christ teach them? It's not, go pray this prayer all the time. You know, when I was playing basketball in high school, this prayer is what we prayed before every single game. You know, there is absolutely nothing in here about a basketball game. Now, I don't, I don't think that, that God cared too much about Wayne County basketball. I don't think He cares too much about NBA basketball or college basketball or NFL sports. You know, it's, it's interesting. You look, at, you look at sidelines back in the day. It's not so much anymore. Back in the day, you would look at sidelines. you got this guy over here praying that they would win, this guy on the other side of the field praying that their team would win. And then, then they're going to say, well, God must be a, a fan of blah, 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 because... They want, that's not how that works, folk. We, we, we've changed prayer into just a, a list of, of, of demands and, 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 and things that we want to get. And what happens is the Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. He helps teach us how to pray. Here Jesus Christ is teaching them to pray What? Um, our Father which art in heaven. Where is the Father? The Father is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That's something that they should already know from the Old Testament Scripture. And that's an important thing. Notice, thy kingdom come. They're praying for the kingdom of God to come down here on the earth. That's not what we pray today, folks. We shouldn't be. And if we're in a church that is praying for that, then they're not praying biblically. I should say dispensationally. And, and there's, a, there's a difference between being, being scripturally correct and dispensationally correct. Now, you can scripturally pray uh, for something like, you know, you go back to, to Noah. You can pray for God to help build an ark. Well, that's not what he's doing today, folks. So he's not going to help you build an ark. And so then when you look at these, you've got to understand there are things that these folks that Jesus Christ is teaching to pray that's in their, in their future. One of them is, thy kingdom come. God's kingdom will come down here on the earth one day. Now, it's not in, in the hearts of men. It's not some spiritual kingdom that we're a part of. We just don't see it yet. That's, that's hogwash, honestly. That's not even scriptural. And, and people go over and they say, well, when Jesus Christ is talking, He says, the, the kingdom is within you. Well, He's talking to Pharisees when He says that. The kingdom of God's not in them. He's talking about the fact that it's in their midst. The fact that He was here on the earth, His kingdom was at hand. That kingdom, by the way, that literal, visible, physical, earthly, David kingdom one day will be placed on this earth. But he's not doing that today. But this is what he was preparing them for. Notice, thy will be done as in earth, so in heaven. Or so as in earth, heaven, so in earth. And so then what, he's, what they're saying is, whatever you're doing in the, in the heavens, we want it to be done here on the earth as well. Because why? Because there's a kingdom being prepared up there that's going to be brought down to the earth one day. Give us, give us day by day our daily bread. Do you know why? Because they're going to go through the tribulation period where they're not going to be able to buy or sell to get food and God's going to provide them every single day. That was a prayer that they had to pray that you and I today don't have to pray. You go to your, you go to your, your, your pantry, you go to your refrigerator and tell me you need to pray for bread every day. It's stocked full of stuff that you won't eat. Trust me, ours is. I know exactly what it's like. We've got an abundance of food. We don't have to pray to God every day for food. We've got it. Now, there are folks in our, in our world right now that don't have food. 
But I tell you what, them praying day by day for food, they're not going to get it. Why? Because that's not what God's doing today. Well, what do they have to do? They have to rely on people who are in the church, the body of Christ, to help provide for them. Notice in verse 4, And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And you go down through there, and there's some things that it's saying, and they say what? Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive one another uh, that is indebted to us. And so they're saying what? Forgive us our sins. By the way, you already have your sins forgiven. So don't pray to God to forgive you your sins. Just thank Him that He's already done that. So then when we go through here, my issue here is what? He's teaching them how to pray. Just as John also taught his disciples. So that's an interesting thing for us to be able to keep in mind. So the question might be, well, what do we pray for today? Well, go back to Romans chapter 8. And, and we'll, we'll take a look at some of these things as we go through. Because this issue of prayer is very important. Um, you know, Paul, Paul says... <clears throat> Paul says that there are some things that, that people say that, they, that he taught and some would even affirm that they say. You know, we, we know folks that say, you all don't believe in prayer. We do believe in prayer. 100% we believe in prayer. We just don't pray as the heathen do. You know, you go back over to, 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 to Matthew chapter 6 and you find out that they just stand up in front of everybody with their long prayers just to be heard. That's not how you pray. Prayer is something different. Prayer can be public. Prayer can be private. Is there, a, is there a verse in Scripture that tells you you have to close your eyes and, and get down on your knees and bow your head and, and, and all this stuff? Well, it did for the nation of Israel. But Paul says, pray without ceasing. Now, let me ask you a question. As you're driving down the road and you're praying... Are you going to close your eyes while you're driving down the road to pray? No. So then that means the, that's not the issue. The issue is the praying, the speaking to your Father. Because that's what He's desiring, His communication from you about the doctrine that's stored up in your soul. And that's how we have to pray. That's what we have to pray from. And that's what Jesus Christ was teaching them back there. Back over in Romans chapter 8, notice... Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That, that, that last word, ought there. We ought to know. We should know. Notice, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, let's stop there for just a second. That's not the hostile Shonda speaking in tongues type prayer. That's not what he's talking about there. He's not talking about some sort of spiritual prayer that, that, that the Holy Spirit takes your prayers in English and translates it into some spiritual way for, for God to be able to actually understand what you're talking about. That's not what he's dealing with. you you got to think, you, when you back up to Romans chapter 8, in, um, in verse 22, notice he says, For we know that the whole creation, notice, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Now, hold your place here. Go over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I know we're running, running low on time, but let's go take a look at this real quick. We've looked at it a little bit before, but there's some issues here. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, the physical earthly house that we have, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. By the way, what's that talking about? That's talking about our catching away. When we get caught away, whether by rapture or death one day, when the rapture takes place, we're going to be given a whole new body. 
fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's the building that we have in the heavenly places that's not made by hands that we're going to one day be clothed upon. Now, you go back to Romans chapter 8, isn't that exactly what he's just got through talking about? We groan as we live and walk and have our being here on the earth. We groan looking for, notice, verse 23, Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're waiting for that adoption. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. And what we find out in Romans 8, 26 but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What, what's the issue that he's dealing with there is what? Praying to have this, to, to be able to endure through the sufferings and the Holy Spirit is the one that is going to be able to help us do that by teaching us how to pray. And it's not just, the, you know, sometimes you just... You just can't think of the words to say. Well, the Spirit teaches us. And that's an important thing for us to know. Well, we've come to the end of, of our video today. And I do want to make this available to you again. Uh, it's the Dictionary of the Gospel. It's, it's a wonderful little book. It really deals with the first three chapters of the book of Romans. And then it goes over some other things as well. But it's, it's a tremendous, I, I believe it will be a tremendous blessing to you. This is, this is free to you, absolutely free of charge. Uh, all we ask is that you read it. And if you have questions about anything, you come to us and ask us. Uh, we love nothing more than questions. If we, can help, if we can help somebody come to a greater knowledge and understanding of God's Word, then that's what we're here for. And in this, this, this series today, what we're dealing with is going through the prayer issue. It's an important thing for us to make sure that we get and understand what's going on. Uh, we want to thank you for the time that you've given us today. And until next time, grace and peace.